Leslie Morse. My name is Danny. Fidel Glasgow. Brendan Cahill. Joanne Carney. Kelly Bryan. Charles Cook. It's Eileen Cummins. I had a liver transplant. I had a double lung transplant. I had the double lung transplant and the kidney pancreas. The next thing I remember, I was waking up and recovering with someone else's heart in my chest. I got a kidney pancreas transplant. That's changed my life. Go from 4% kidney function to 80% kidney function overnight. It's not a recovery, it's a transformation. Things are changing at an exceptionally rapid pace. Some of the things that we were just thinking about a few years ago are now reality. Putting organs in an icebox in the cooler is something of the past. We develop the future as we speak. I think it's very fair to say that the world is watching us. We live in very, very exciting times. The future is now. We are a leader in transplantation. Just looking at the numbers in the last year, we did the highest number of lung transplants in the world. Toronto was always known to be the epicenter of all advances in lung transplantation, but also in other organ transplants as well. We get physicians and surgeons who come from all around the world to learn both medical and surgical techniques. We keep the best and brightest of those here in our program. I think it's attracting the best and brightest, bringing them all together, having them collaborate, not compete. When I was in Spain, I was already working in a transplant team, but I knew that, you know, Toronto had the best program to train in organ transplants. The possibilities that exist here do not exist anywhere else in the world. And the discoveries that we can make, I think, are absolutely limitless. We have a background in stem cell research, and the connection with the transplant unit provides the next step to bring what we do in the lab to the clinic, going from bench to bedside. I remember once picking up my daughter and son from school, and I remember thinking in my head, I wish they had a wagon to pull me because I feel like I can't make it. Life before sucked. <laughs> If I would go anywhere, I had to bring a portable oxygen tank with me. Could barely walk from my car to the grocery store. It was interesting to watch your life shrink. I couldn't do many of the things that were, you know, what I always felt were important to me. So it made my life smaller and smaller and smaller. I start having trouble with the kidney and very painful. I can, I can do anything, can enjoy life, nothing. I had a kidney removed at the age of five, was cared for at Toronto General by the kidney clinics there who helped me manage what turned out to be a, a slowly progressing disease. In 2009, when I went into full-fledged heart failure, at that point we were just waiting because we knew it was a matter of time. We were holding our breath, waiting for the other shoe to drop on my heart health. So we both suffered from cystic fibrosis. There was no way out. Like there was just surviving. So you're, you're going through the daily motions every day, but you're not living. And you're just hoping that you can get to that end point, which was for us transplant. If I didn't have this transplant, that was gonna be my life until it ended. I was basically at fifth stage kidney failure. So next stage after then that is, you're not here anymore. When people first come to see me, they are looking for a cure. They're looking for some hope and we can actually offer that with transplantation. Ex vivo perfusion of donor organs began primarily in lung, pioneered here, where they were able to take lungs outside of a donor and restart them, treat them, make them better, and then implant them. And now we have this extraordinary capacity for studying those organs, for taking them out of the body. We're putting them onto circuits where we can start to model them, change them, fix them, and then put them back. We're removing viral infections from organs. We're changing the immunology of the organ. The potential of the ex vivo system is that hundreds of organs now become available. 
and all these people that sit on waiting lists and don't come off the waiting list will now have an organ and each one of those organs will save a life. One of the examples we have more recently is using organs from donors that are infected with hepatitis C virus. So we can use ex vivo to be able to inactivate the hepatitis C virus and make transportation a lot safer. Stem cell-based therapy offers the potential of treating many more patients than what we can currently do. A person with type 1 diabetes is constantly thinking of the level of sugar in the bloodstream, and so the idea of using stem cells will provide a source of surrogate islet for these patients with the idea that one day we could transplant them, allowing this patient to eliminate insulin injections once and for all. We already do a lot of, of transplant for cancer here at UHN. 40 to 50% of the transplants we do are for people that actually have cancer of the liver. I think the fascinating thing about it is even with advanced disease confined to the liver, the survival of these patients is very good. Transportation is important, of course, it's our heart, that's what we do, but the technology itself can do much, much more. It could be applied to cancer surgery, we could modify organs, we could induce resistance against certain diseases. So I think we're just opening the door, and now behind that is an entire new world. In heart, the outset was a bit more daunting of a task to set up a system to restart a heart outside of the body, to make it work, to assess its function, to keep it alive. It's essentially called ex vivo heart perfusion, where we're taking the hearts out of the body and perfusing it and seeing how long we can maintain the hearts. By using systems like the ex vivo, we can actually bring them back, start them beating again, and test them to see if they're good for transplant. It's very exciting. Stem cell technology, ex vivo perfusion, it's all happening right now. It's been a ton of work to get it to this point, but it's really taking off. And the center of it is right here in Toronto. You wake up from the surgery and you literally like wake up and you feel different. Slowly, hour by hour, day by day, it slowly change. Now I don't cough at all anymore. Now I can run and play with my son. Every day feels like a new day. They actually blessed me with kidney and pancreas. I'm more than thankful to, to just even be here, to be able to do simple things. I can put the kids in the wagon and pull them around and I'm okay. I never think I can have babies. Finally, I got my kidney transplant. One year after, I got pregnant with my first baby. Miracles really happened. I can't be detached. I went to see a patient this morning, and he's on a peripheral bypass machine after his heart transplant, and he's going to get that removed today because he's recovered, and I actually cried. It is not possible in the world that we live in to remain detached. The telephone rings, and uh, Toronto General, we think we got a heart for you. Why don't you come on down? When I go and I share my story now, especially the people who I'm trying to convince to become organ donors is that it's not just the life that you give someone who receives an organ, it's the quality of life. I understand, nobody wants to talk about it, it's a scary thing, but you have to talk about it because you get the chance to extend somebody else's life. Donation helps another life. It's the most magical gift you can give. I think of my son, and I think if my donor family saved his mom. Because of them, I get to live again. I believe it's eight lives that you can save with somebody who wants to be an organ donor. It's actually more than that because those eight lives, they're connected to so many more lives. Because somebody was caring enough, they saved my life. Saved my life. Gave my kids their dad. Let me just live a life that <laughs> people take for granted. Life goes awry, as it always does, and it turned out that I, I couldn't donate directly to Joe. But luckily in Canada, we've got this, this kidney paired exchange. You know, going through that process, you know, knowing that I should be the match, but then realizing there's an even better opportunity out there where Joe could get basically a perfect kidney. And, you know, all it took was me donating to a stranger, but that doesn't matter because Joe gets a kidney that's far better than the one that I could have donated to her. Many people don't know that if they are healthy, that they can donate a kidney or a part of their liver 
to save someone's life. A relative, a friend, family member, even sometimes an anonymous donor will donate part of the liver. The fascinating thing here is that the liver regenerates. That donor will have a totally normal life and actually that liver will also regenerate as much as it needs in the recipient and hopefully the recipient will have a totally healthy life. We leave you tonight with a single act of kindness that multiplied. A living donor decided to give a large portion of her liver to a complete stranger. My name is Kelly Bryan and I gave 52% of my liver. I always set out to do little things like donate blood, but I didn't realize that living liver donor was even an option. And then I saw um, someone's public plea um, that they needed one, and that's when I made the decision to do it. It feels so good to see someone and know that he's here and he's healthy because he got that part of my liver. The gesture of what she did really speaks to who she is. And in general, she's just a very giving and loving person, and I think we we can learn from that, we all can, that we we belong to each other and we all need to help each other, whatever it may be. Philanthropy is about making an impact. There's no bigger or greater impact than life. The one thing we do need is help. We need help to make our dreams a reality for patients. My entire lab and the people working in my lab wouldn't be there without the help of donors. That is really what has allowed our transplant program research to move forward. You really need philanthropy to spur innovation. Innovation leads to discoveries and discoveries lead to cures. It's like you become an author because my story changed. When you donate, you give people new stories. If it's five dollars, give that five dollars because that five dollars has me sitting here talking to you today. The future is now at UHM. This is a world-renowned hospital and that's how it feels. Ever since I walked through the doors, I felt like there's been a team and I've been a part of it. We are surrounded by the future. The future is in transplantation. My hospital is my second home. This is my family. Thanks God I'm here. The motivation is there every day because you see the patients, you see the surgeons, you see the outcomes, and you see your goal every day. I'm very hopeful for the future. It's the love that these doctors have for what they do. That really drives everything in the transplant program. It's truly a joy every day that I come to work. Call it a love bomb because it blows and it has a ripple effect. I would say like the biggest blessing that I've had. Gift of life, there's, there's nothing that can, can outweigh that for sure. <laughs>